a slide that I found that I added to the PowerPoint since we did this class in September is actually, um, because I know there was a lot of talk about who's who in this picture. I mistakenly misidentified this gentleman here in the middle as James Wilson, because he seems like the James Wilson um, figure in Signers Hall that I'm very familiar with. Um, but I actually did find this little handy dandy graphic um, that shows you who is who. And James Wilson is actually over here, which obviously makes sense. Oops. He's um, our, uh, our bespeckled <laughs> delegate there. Um, and the man I misidentified as James Wilson is the um, as actually William Jackson, the secretary of the convention. So I did, um, for those of you who are interested, I did put this into the PowerPoint that's available at that link that I just shared. So definitely give it a, a look because I know we had a fun playing the who's who's guessing game, but we also want answers, I know. Does it depict all the people that are actually there? I don't know if this is everybody or if this is just the people that were um, at signing day. Um, I think, let's see. If it's um, if it's forty, it's probably just signing day, would be my guess. Hello, Jenna. Hi, Tom. I was sharing the uh, the little graphic that I found. <laughs> I love that thing. I'm not always the best with like faces and figures. I'm much more of like a words person, so it's very helpful to have this map. <laughs> Well, because I also also had always assumed that this guy who's uh, being blocked by an arm was Jacob Broom, but apparently Jacob Broom is actually all the way back here in the back. <laughs> that makes sense too. Hi, Colin. But yeah, because in uh, obviously our statue in Signer's Hall, he has kind of got his hand up in front of his face since we don't yeah. know exactly what he would look like. <laughs> There were two names under the number 10. I think it was, um, I think it got cut off when I um, transferred it to the PowerPoint. I think that's supposed to be 40. So I think it just, that the four got cut off because I actually made made the space in between the columns a little tighter. Lorelai, sorry about that. <laughs> I'll try to fix it in the, uh, in the PowerPoint online. Um, so Colin says that um, Professor Marr said that there were paintings from the era where they painted in people who weren't there. Tom, do you know anything about that? I do not. No, the only thing I can think of um, is in Signers Hall, we do have a statue of John Dickinson who wasn't actually at signing day um, because he was ill. Um, his name appears on the document because he was it was signed in absentia, but we still have his statue in the room. So uh, maybe that's who uh, was painted in. I don't know. <laughs> Might've been a different painting, maybe. I know that um, the declaration wasn't signed at once the way the constitution was. So I know that some sometimes those images are a little bit more, there's a little bit more creative license taken with, with images of the, uh, the declaration. Hi, Warren. Good to see you. Oh, hi, Warren. Um, all right. Well, I think it's just about time. So I'll get started. Um, we'll record and then, uh, and then dive in. It was tricky getting my controls back. Sorry. One second. All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the National Constitution Center's online classes and a very happy birthday to James Madison today. Uh, we are celebrating his birthday the best way, way we know how by looking at the Constitutional Convention. Um, so I am Jenna Karras. I am the Director of Learning and Engagement, and so I'll be your moderator today. But I am joined by one of our top scholars here at the Center, Tom Donnelly. Hi, Tom. Hey, Jenna. Great to be here. Yeah. And happy birthday, James Madison, to 
celebrate his birthday and talk about the Constitutional Convention. We have some uh, big questions that we're going to get through today. Um, why do we have a constitution in the first place? Why does the founding uh, generation um, create one? Um, how did it differ from the uh, sort of governing document that we had prior to it, the Articles of Confederation, and then um, kind of diving deeper into the convention, um, what uh, what were some of the compromises um, and debates and compromises that that uh, you know took place the summer of 1787? But uh, Tom, you want to just kind of give us the big idea of what you want to cover in class today? Yeah, absolutely. So the big idea here is that with the U.S. Constitution, the founding generation established a new national government, and this government was more powerful than the government created by the Articles of Confederation, which was the framework of government that came before the U.S. Constitution but also one of limited powers. The one thing I'll add here, Jenna, is we also want to focus on the role that compromise played at the convention. And so they, as, the, as the framers tried to learn from previous experiences and then negotiate their differences to come together with a document that they could agree to. Yeah, perfect. And, and also convince the American people that it was a good one, right? Absolutely. Um, all right, so before we dive into the convention, let's take a little uh, walking tour of the uh, Constitution itself. So what, what was the kind of starting with the end? What, what did we get out of the convention? Um, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's great. I mean, the Constitution itself is composed of a preamble, seven articles, and 27 amendments. And the, the composition of the, uh, the Constitution, the preamble, and the seven articles was done near the end of the convention by Pennsylvania delegate Governor Morris, he was largely the penman of the Constitution, creating that structure that we can now follow. The Constitution begins with the famous phrase, we the people, among the most inspiring language in the Constitution itself. And what this language speaks to is that the Constitution is rooted in popular sovereignty. This principle that the foundation of all government comes from the people, not a monarch, not an aristocracy, not an oligarchy, not the few, but the many. The people themselves, they are the root foundation of the legitimacy of the Constitution. And so that's what the preamble is telling us at the very beginning. The Constitution is rooted in we the people. From there, the, the Constitution then gives us three articles that lay out the three branches of government. This is Articles 1, 2, and 3. Article 1 gives us the legislative branch, Congress, which is tasked with making the laws. Article 2 lays out the executive branch, which is led by a single president responsible for enforcing the laws. And Article 3 outlines the judicial branch with the Supreme Court as the highest court with a duty to interpret the law. So that's just the framework of government right there, Articles 1, 2, and 3. Yeah, so it's great to have that like right there from the outset, like the three branches of government, not only separating that those powers, but also they kind of the, the Constitution tells us how they all interact together, but kind of gives us that that structure of um, of government in that in that structural constitution, uh, you know, uh, articles. But then, even though we have power divided among those three separate branches, you make the great point that that preamble first and foremost tells us that we, the people, have the ultimate authority. That popular sovereignty uh, value is there from the very beginning. But that's not all the Constitution does. There's a couple extra articles after one, two, and three. So uh, tell us what those other articles of the Constitution do. Yeah, the first three articles give us the structure of government. The last four articles tie up a lot of loose ends. There's a lot of work that's done in articles four, five, six, and seven. Article four is a bit of a hodgepodge. It addresses the relationship between the states, between the states and their citizens. But it also tells us how to handle the admission of new states and how to govern the federal territories. And it includes the infamous Fugitive Slave Clause. Article five is one of my favorite parts of the Constitution. It lays out the process for amending the Constitution. It lets us change the Constitution's text. And you know this is a really cool feature of the Constitution because it reminds us a couple things about the founding generation. One was that they didn't think that they knew everything. They didn't think they had a monopoly on constitutional wisdom. And two, they believed deeply in learning new lessons over time. So learning from history, learning from lived experience, draw on those lessons to make the government better. And they wrote that very value, that value of constitutional reform into Article 5, allowing the American people to learn from their experiences over time and hopefully make the document better. Article 6 establishes the supremacy of national law over the laws of the states. It also bans religious tests for national office. And Article 7 is another one of my favorites. It sets out the process for ratifying the Constitution. It says that once nine states agree to the Constitution, it would go into effect. But it again, speaks deeply of this principle of popular sovereignty, 
Because what's so amazing about this provision is it tells us that it didn't matter that the framers in the convention were brilliant. It didn't mean that the convention itself, it didn't matter. It's simply that, 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 that uh, the famous people were there like George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. It didn't matter that they liked this constitution. Instead, they thought it was important to send this new document out to the American people to say yes or no. The American people almost said no. We almost rejected the constitution. This ratification process was hard fought, but it tells us a lot about the founding generation's faith in the American people and their belief in a government that's really rooted in popular sovereignty. I love that it's the beginning and end of the constitution is that popular sovereignty that starting with the preamble, ending with that um, article seven ratification that it's we the people, those are the, have the ultimate authority. That's such a good thing to remember. Um, okay, so Articles 1, 2, and 3, structural constitutions, Articles um, 4 through 7, kind of those loose ends, amendment process. Um, you know, the fact that we can amend the Constitution, uh, it's, it's not easy, but it, it can be done, it's possible, kind of brings us to that, uh, my next thing we want to cover, which was the document that came before it, which was the uh, Articles of Confederation, and wasn't as easy to, to amend. So tell us and what, 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 what was the Articles of Confederation, um, and what were some of the issues that we were having with it that led us to, um, you know, want to revise it? So before the U.S. Constitution, we had other frameworks of government. At the national level, we had the Articles of Confederation. At the state level, each state had its own state constitution. So as we're thinking about why did we need a constitutional convention, why did we need a new constitution, part of it arises from these amazing years between when we declare independence in 1776 and when we hold this constitutional convention in 1787. We learn a lot in that just over a decade. And so what are some of the big lessons? Well, let's start with the Articles of Confederation. So the Articles of Confederation establishes a framework of national government. The thing to really, the big thing to know about the Articles of Confederation is that it establishes a weak government. The national government has very little power under the Articles of Confederation and the states have a ton of power. So that's how the balance between the national government and the states existed prior to the United States Constitution. So the, the, when we think about the Articles of Confederation, it describes itself as a league of friendship between the states. And so when I think of the Articles of Confederation in many ways, it's more like the United Nations than the United States of America. And so that's, that's the big structure of the Articles of Confederation. You know, how, you know what, what were some of the details? What were the main things that the founding generation responded to with the new constitution? Well, one, the Articles of Confederation, the national government itself only had one branch. It had a Congress. And Congress only, it was only one House of Congress. So all power was vested in that Congress. We didn't have a separate executive branch like a president, like we know it today. And we didn't have a separate federal judiciary. And so all power is being lodged in that single body Congress. But the other thing is that the Articles of Confederation grants the national government very little power. And so there are big things that we think of today, the big things that nations usually do that the national government under the, under the Articles of Confederation simply could not do. It couldn't raise taxes. It couldn't regulate commerce, so regulate business between the different states. It couldn't force states to provide troops to the national government. Couldn't force the states to send the government money. When the national government needed money, they requested it from the states. You can imagine how willing the states were to give up money to the national government. Didn't go too well. Um, and then finally, and Jenna already telegraphed this, is that the Articles of Confederation also were really, 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 really hard to amend. They were hard to change. If you wanted to amend the Articles of Confederation, every state had to agree. So it was a, a requirement of unanimity. As a result, even as a wide range of Americans came to see problems with the Articles of Confederation, we never amended them because it was too hard. Has there ever been a constitutional amendment that was ratified by all 50 or all, like all the states at the time? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I think maybe by, you know, not, I, I don't know if at, at the time of when it was just ratified, I think eventually other states do. Yeah, they pick ratified. Off. yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's really, yeah. I was like, huh, I wonder if we even could do it today. <laughs> that's how hard it is though. That like, um, okay. And then the state governments, like, tell me about them. Like how were they functioning at the time? Yeah, yeah. So with the Articles of Confederation, we have a government that's it's really, really hard for it to raise money. It's hard for it to fund the government, hard for the national government to pay the troops. It's hard for the national government to regulate uh, business between the states. At the same time, we have these state constitutions, which are really these amazing documents. After we declare independence, Congress says, states, write your own constitutions. 
It's this amazing period of constitutional creativity and experimentation. What we see across the states are these state constitutions, for the most part, give a ton of power to the legislative branch and very little power to their governors, so the executive branch, and their courts, the judicial branch. And so over time, with the founding generation, they look at these forms of government and they say, you know, in the end, we think these state governments gave too much power to the state legislatures. We don't really trust any single branch to have too much power. And so as we're moving towards the Constitutional Convention, many key framers, including James Madison, James Wilson, they begin to think, you know, when we're creating government, when we're creating constitutions, we need to make sure that there are checks on the legislative branch. And so they begin to think about we need to give the executive branch more power. We may need to give the courts more power because in the end, we don't trust any single branch of government with all the power. And so this is a lesson growing out of these state governments. In part, it's also a response to what they see as bad policies passed by these state governments. And these are policies like putting up trade barriers between the states. The states may say, are, you know, we're going we're gonna to really promote our own businesses and, not, and, and try to make it harder for other states to do business. So there's a bunch of trade wars going on between the states. Also, the state governments, in response to an economic downturn, are passing a variety of laws undermining property rights. And so as the founding generation is looking at these state governments and the Articles of Confederation, they're saying, it was really amazing that we got to write these new frameworks of government, but we messed up in certain ways. And so they wanted, they, they, they're urging uh, a push for reform, thinking that they can do better based on these lived experiences. It reminds me of that, uh, the Laboratories of Democracy quote, that like we had that kind of 11 year period where we, the states experimented with constitutions as a whole before we, we really wrote ours. All right, and but there was, so we have this tension between like this really kind of strong states and strong legislatures within the states and a weak national government. This all kind of comes to a head with Shays' Rebellion. So tell us about Shays' Rebellion. Yeah, so Shays' Rebellion, it happens in late 1786. It's reflective of this period where we see an economic downturn, and it's an uprising among farmers in Western Massachusetts. And what they're saying is we have high taxes on our land. We don't have any money. We have growing debts. You're throwing us in debtor's prison. State government, you're not hearing our concerns. You're not responding to them. And so what they do is they decide to march. And it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a large scale example of mob violence in Western Pennsylvania. Who's Shays? Well, the Shays is Daniel Shays. He was a 39-year-old farmer from Western Massachusetts, but he was, he, was a, he was a veteran of the American Revolution. He fought in Lexington, he fought at Bunker Hill, and now he's looking at the government that's been created and said, you know, this, the national government, the state government, they're not hearing our concerns. And so the farmers march. They march across Western Massachusetts. They seize control of court buildings. They close down debtors' prisons. They look to seize the arsenal, the state arsenal in Springfield, Massachusetts. They want to march on Boston. They want Boston and the Massachusetts state government to take notice and to hear their concerns. And for the founding generation, they were nervous and appalled and fearful of this. Part of it was because Congress and the national government could really do very little to respond to this rising mob violence. They didn't have the power to raise troops. So in the end, Shays Rebellion is put down by a Massachusetts militia, not by national troops. And so for George Washington, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, they look at Shays' Rebellion as one, uh, one example of, 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 of you know, some of the problems in the country at large and a problem when the national government can't either put down mob violence or respond to some of the underlying concerns of the American people. And so their concern is that Shays' Rebellion may be the first of many examples. And so there's a lot that's wrong with the state governments. There's a lot that's wrong with the Articles of Confederation. They push for reform and they ultimately push for the Constitutional Convention. All right, so that brings us to that big moment, Philadelphia, 1787, and the Constitutional Convention. So before we get into those compromises, tell us a little bit about who was there, who were the people in the room, what, what was the makeup of the delegates, um, and so, sort of set the stage. Yeah, so the, the, the Constitutional Convention, it's called, for, it, called by Congress to, for the express purposes of, of, of uh, its sole and express purpose of revising the Articles <laughs> yeah. of Confederation. So Congress saying, revise the Articles. But if you're George Washington, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, you've lived under this experience, you realize the articles are never going to be amended. So they're going to push for a new constitution at the Constitutional Convention. Um, you know, the Constitutional Convention itself runs from May 1787 to September 17, 1787. So the Constitution's framed in a little under 100 working days, which is kind of, that's, that's really quite good work. You know, if we're looking at the convention itself, 
if we're looking at the convert convention itself, this is the room where it helped, happened, as Colin said. And who are some of the figures there? At the front of the room, we see George Washington seated, seated there in that uh, beautiful light blue suit is Benjamin Franklin. And so just looking at this picture itself, we see the two most beloved Americans, the two most respected Americans in the world are in this room. And so that signals immediately to everyone that something important is happening here. And it took a lot of work by figures like James Madison and Alexander Hamilton to get Washington into the room. Washington understood the problems with the framework of government, but he was ready to retire. And, but in the end, they got him in the room because he really believed deeply in the need for a new framework of government. You know, if we're looking more broadly at the convention, conventions held in the Pennsylvania State House, now known as Independence Hall, um, yeah, the delegates are appointed by their state legislatures. They vote by state. So if, whether you have a lot of people or not a lot of people, each state gets one vote. Rhode Island refuses to send a delegation. They thought this is this whole thing's a scam. We don't want a strong national government. So they don't send any delegates. Um, on the final day of the convention, three delegates, Elbridge, Gary, George Mason, and Edmund Randolph, re refused to sign the Constitution. The Constitution itself ratified on June 21st, 1788, and it goes into effect in the meeting of the first Congress uh, in, on March 4th, 1789. Who wasn't in the room? I'll just highlight two big people who weren't in the room. We get this question all the time. Thomas Jefferson wasn't in the room. He was in France. And John Adams wasn't in the room. He was in England. They were both serving their nation uh, in, in a diplomatic capacity. Yeah, that's definitely the number one question in signers. <laughs> Where, of course, Thomas Jefferson? Um, but I think it's so important that you point out that like having Washington there kind of was a signal to Americans that they could trust what was happening. Cause like we said, it was all held in secret. No one knew what was happening. They were essentially like throwing away the government, uh, the governing document, um, but the, like people trusted Washington. So that, that was kind of his biggest impact was that just his presence there kind of reassured the American people. Is that right, Tom? Is that yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that, that, and it was absolutely essential that he was there um, uh, uh, and it was very important for Madison and, and Hamilton to, to get him there. Yeah. And that, um, just to answer Colin's question, that yes, that's the same room in the assembly room of the State House, now known as Independence Hall, is where they uh, had the uh, Continental Congress, the Second Continental Congress, that uh, declared independence as well. So yeah, that kind of through line symbolism is is very important. All right. So the convention itself. We've got, a, like you said, 100 working days to shape a government, um, but there was uh, some stuff they knew what they wanted to do, but other stuff they kind of had to work out. Um, so we have some key compromises, uh, which kind of came from those key debates, right? Absolutely. So yeah, we're going to go through the Connecticut or Great Compromise, the compromise over the presidency, in particular, the Electoral College, and then two of the compromises over the institution of slavery, the Three-Fifths Compromise and the Slave Trade Clause. So let's start with the Connecticut Compromise, which was about that issue of representation. So explain that to us, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. So the Connecticut or Great Compromise, it's all about how are we going to structure power in this new Congress. And so this, these are really, these are among the most heated debates at the convention. It pits large states, states with a lot of people, against small states, those states with not a lot of people. Under, remember, under the Articles of Confederation, Congress was a single house and it was organized under the principle of equal state representation, which means every state, no matter its size, had the same number of votes. As we get into the convention, though, we see competing visions on how we should structure Congress. The debates are largely driven by what's known as the Virginia Plan. The Virginia Plan was the brainchild of James Madison. Um, and for purposes of Congress, it, it had two big ideas. One was that, unlike the Articles of Confederation, it said, we need a Congress that has two houses. So it split the split Congress into two houses. The reason is that for the founding generation, they feared Congress would, would become the most powerful part of the national government. So they thought by dividing the powers of Congress, they could avoid certain threats of abuses of power by that new branch of government. So they'd split, that's called bicameralism, splitting Congress into two houses. But the other thing is the Virginia plan said, when organizing power in Congress, you should, you should uh, choose each state should get a number of seats that goes along with its population. So if you're a big state like Virginia, with a lot of people, you get relatively more safe states. And if you're a small state like Connecticut, you get fewer, fewer, fewer seats. And that's how the Virginia plan said both houses of Congress should be structured. You can imagine how the small states responded. They said, yeah, well, that sounds like a great plan if you're from Virginia and so, or Pennsylvania. And so another group of delegates come forward with what's known as the New Jersey plan. It's put together largely by William Patterson of New Jersey. And effectively, 
basically what it says is to Congress is, you know, there are problems with the Articles of Confederation, but the structure of Congress isn't one of them. And so what the New Jersey, Jersey plan says is we should have a Congress, the legislative branch, but it should still be organized. It should still be a single house and it should still be organized by the principle of equal state representation, meaning every state, no matter what its population is, should get the same number of votes. And so we have big debates over how to structure Congress. In the end, the compromise is brokered by, not surprisingly, given the name the Connecticut Compromise, by delegates from the state of Connecticut. These are Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth. And it, effectively what this compromise does is it splits the difference. It says, you know, for the, we're, we're, we're gonna go with the, what the Virginia plan says, we're gonna split Congress into two houses. And for the US House of Representatives, we're gonna organize that one by population. So James Madison, you win there. And for the Senate, we're gonna organize that by equal state representation with each state, no matter its size, getting two votes. So New Jersey plan, William Patterson, you win there. In the end, they, the, the delegates agree to this compromise, but only by a single vote. It's bitterly, it's a bitterly divided vote, bitter debates. James Madison's outraged, he hates the Great Compromise, but in the end, you know, he, we, we coalesce around the compromise and Madison himself would go on to defend the structure of Congress in his famous Federalist Paper essays. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that, you know, it, it compromise means not everybody gets what they want all the time. It's like they, they had to compromise to move on, but there were some people that were still really upset with the, the outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah so, those, those, yeah, so those are the big compromises over Congress. Should we move to the presidency? Absolutely. Let's talk about the compromises over the presidency. Yeah, so the president for the delegates was in many ways the most difficult uh, part of the Constitution to figure out. Part of, it, part of the reason why is they looked around and they couldn't really find an example of what they were looking for. So they looked over to Europe and they saw kings that seemed too powerful. They looked to their own state governments and they saw governors that seemed too weak to govern effectively. So as a result, they tried to find some sort of happy medium between the kings of Europe and their own weak state governors. And so over time, they end up wrestling with four big issues over the structure of the presidency, how to elect the president, how long the president's term should be, whether the president should be allowed to run for re-election, and the question of impeachment and removal. And what they notice as they're debating is some of them would change their views on one of these issues, which would cause people to change it on the other. And so it's all of these interlocking issues that made it really hard to reach a compromise on any one of them. Um, but focusing particularly on the Electoral College, it can give you an idea of how they were able to find sort of a happy medium between a few different key ideas. So there are a range of options that delegates bring forth on how to elect the president. Pennsylvania's James Wilson, who had many of the big ideas about the presidency that shaped Article II of the Constitution, argued the president should be elected by direct popular vote. And so for Wilson, he said, we need to root the presidency in popular sovereignty. We need a president that could stand up to Congress. And the best way to do that is to make sure that the president's voted directly by the voters. Now, this wasn't a particularly popular view at the convention. Um, uh, people pushed back against it, but it was one of the options on the table. You know, the flip side is that many delegates said, no, 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 the, we don't want direct popular election. We should have election by Congress. The Congress should select the presidency. The reason being that Congress includes the most knowledgeable members in America. They're gonna know all of the people running for president that are real contenders. They're gonna know them personally. They're gonna know their character. And so we're gonna get the best decision-making by Congress. The concern there, though, was that the president is supposed to be a check on Congress. If Congress is choosing the president, isn't the president just gonna be in the pocket of Congress? Doesn't this eliminate that potential check and balance? And Governor Morris of Pennsylvania also warned that, you know, the selection of president would then become the, quote, work of intrigue, of cabal, of faction. You get the sense of Governor Morris saying here, I'm one of these people. I know how we operate. We can't really trust ourselves to do this. And so in the end, we come up with this idea of the Electoral College, which is somewhere in between Wilson's idea of direct popular election and between congressional election of the president. So what we do is we'll create a separate body that's tasked with electing the president. Each state gets a number of electors that are equal to the number of members of Congress that it has. And in the end, this Electoral College, the electors themselves, uh, are going to be that we're going to the, the rules that determine who becomes an elector and how we elect them are determined by each state. Um, and so what we've settled on over time is that we go to the polls in November and we vote formally. We vote for president or vice president, but formally we're voting for a slate of electors chosen by each party. Those electors formally meet in December. And in the end, if whoever gets a majority of the electoral college vote becomes president, even if they lost the popular vote. And importantly, if no one gets a majority of the Electoral College, the election is then sent to the House of Representatives to be voted on by the delegations voting by state. So that's the Electoral College. It gives us something in between direct 
popular election and selection by Congress. Right. And there were some delegates that thought that that would happen every time, right? That it would always be going to the uh, to Congress. So they'd be getting what they wanted anyway, which was um, selection by Congress, right? Yeah, that's actually the idea is that like, sure, everyone knows George Washington, but after Washington, there aren't going to be many figures that could command a majority in the Electoral College. So the idea would be that that initial vote might winnow the candidates down to a few, and then we would still have the U.S. House of Representatives choosing the president. It didn't work out that way. We can say, we can look back and say, well, that's a ridiculous idea, but you can understand from the psychology of the time, no one had tried anything like this before, and so it wasn't an unreasonable prediction. Right. All right, so we have about five minutes left, and I do want to get to those debates over the institution of slavery, because they're really important to talk about when talking about the compromises at the convention. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we have a whole separate course, uh, a whole separate class on, on slavery in America. So check that out um, uh, if you want to hear more. Uh, you know, the, at the convention, the, the, the issue of slavery came up. And it, again, they were among the most heated debates at the convention. Of course, the institution of slavery itself is older than the U.S. Constitution. It's written into colonial law as early as the 1660s in places like Virginia and the Carolinas. And in the 1700s, the institution of slavery expands in America. And as we get to the convention itself, we can see the 25 of 55 convention delegates held enslaved people. Um, and, you know, if we're looking big picture beyond the compromises, what can we say about what the convention did on the institution of slavery more broadly? You know, one is the, the delegates did go out of their way not to write slavery or slave into the Constitution. They, they really, many delegates worked hard to make sure that there was not explicit recognition of what they called the right to property in men in the Constitution itself. But at the same time, to actually get to the finish line and bring all the states together, the convention made important compromises with the slaveholding states, providing important protections for, slave, for the slave power and the institution of slavery in the constitution itself. And finally, and in many ways, the most important part of this is it also left the broader issue, issue of slavery, whether to have the institution of slavery in a state or not, to determination state by state. Each state got to make that decision for itself. All right, so let's look, look at those last two clauses on slavery, sort of um, the, for purposes of representation, we have the three-fifths clause. Yeah, so this, as a practical matter, this is a really, really important compromise, a three-fifths compromise. And what, what it came down to is that you have slavehold, th this is about uh, how to, again, structure political power in Congress. So remember, the U.S. House of Representatives, we, deter we use population to determine how many seats each state gets in the U.S. House of Representatives. And the question for the three-fifths compromise was, how do, we, how do we count enslaved people for purposes of congressional representation? Now, the, the Southern slaveholding states argued that they should get a boost um, in representation based on enslaved people. They said, for per we're not gonna, they said basically, we're not gonna grant African-Americans any rights, but for purposes of congressional representation, we're gonna count them, we should count them as full people. They should count as five fifths and that should boost our political power as slaveholding states. On the other hand, anti-slavery delegates argue, no, that's not, that makes no sense. If you're not gonna grant any rights to African-Americans, you shouldn't get a political boost for holding people in, in enslavement. And so we see you know, the slaveholding delegates arguing that uh, African-Americans should count as five fifths of a person. Whereas the anti-slavery delegates, although believing African-Americans to be full people said for purposes of congressional representation only, they should count as zero fifths. Those slaveholding states should get no boost for holding uh, enslaved people. And then finally, again, the convention comes around uh, with a compromise, the three fifths compromise saying that for purposes of congressional representation, we're gonna count enslaved people as three fifths of a person. Over time, this has great practical importance because it boosts the political power of, of, uh, pro, of, of slaveholding states in Congress by counting enslaved people as three fifths of a person which then in turn increases the pro-slavery influence in the presidency because it's boosting the electoral college power of the slaveholding states. And then finally, those presidents go on to select who's gonna serve on the United States Supreme Court. So in, in, this, in this way, the three-fifths compromise shapes political power across all three branches of the national government. Yeah, I think that's really interesting that you point out that kind of counterintuitive uh, nature of people who wanted to enslave people, wanted also wanted to count them as full people um, for the purposes of representation. It's kind of flips in your mind the way that you normally would think about uh, these people's point of views. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, and then finally, we do have that slave trade clause because they were debating, you know, like you said, whether to continue the practice of slavery at all or to, you know, maybe continue the practice of slavery but end the slave trade. So where do we land on that? 
Yeah, so this last debate is over the international slave trade, and this is that gruesome practice of, of, of ensl bringing enslaved people, of the, enslaving people in Africa, bringing them across in a brutal voyage across the Atlantic Ocean to be enslaved in the United States. And the debate was, do we need to close this practice down? And by the time of the Constitutional Convention, there were even slaveholding delegates, especially from the Upper South in places like Virginia. These would be delegates like George Mason, who argue that no, you know, our critics, they are, they are slaveholders themselves, but also critics, especially of the international slave trade because of its brutality. And so you have certain delegates arguing, no, we need to ban the international slave trade. We're not gonna be able to get rid of the institution of slavery as a whole, but we need to get rid of this practice. On the flip side, you see uh, delegates from the deep South, places like Georgia and South Carolina saying, no, you are not gonna touch the international slave trade. If you, touch, if you try to ban it, we are gonna bolt this convention and you're gonna have to have a union without us. And so in the end, the delegates come together again for another compromise where they say, OK, for, you know, up until 1808, Congress has no power over the international slave trade. So from the ratification of the Constitution in 1788 through 1808, Congress has no power, uh, uh, you know, to, to ban the international slave trade. But come 1808, Congress then has that power. And frankly, you know, once Congress has the power to ban the international slave trade in 1808, it does. It does immediately, but in the meantime, we see, you know, tens of thousands of new African Americans brought over from Africa into the United States and enslaved in that period from 1788 to 1808. So even this compromise ends up having a massive practical effect. Um, well, thank Tom. Thank you so much for taking us through all of this in a half hour. I know that was quick. Um, before final wrap up closing words. I do wanna to get to Colin's question because I think it's a really interesting one. So we knew that going into the convention, the states really had a lot of power. The Articles of Confederation didn't give the federal government a lot of power. How did the new constitution affect those state constitutions and the state governments? You know, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, the, the, the key thing that happens with the, um, you know, with the ratification of the constitution is that, you know, once we ratify it, Article Six of the Constitution makes national law and the Constitution itself supreme over state law. And so it ends up there, there may be parts of those state constitutions that run afoul of what's in the Constitution itself. And as a result of that, that those 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 particular clauses, of the state constitutions are no longer in effect. These end up being debates, you know, within the states themselves. And as they're thinking about ratification, part of what they have to think about is how this is affecting their own structure of government within the states. So for you know, you know, state state officials, state leaders, they have to balance sort of the, on the one hand, the benefits of union and the stronger national government and getting rid of the flawed Articles of Confederation versus you know, various parts of their own state governments and maybe uh, uh, um, uh, broad state powers that they would have without a new US constitution. They have to pit those against each other and decide you know, which is better for our state, which is better for us. Yeah, and it still took like Rhode Island a long time to ratify, right? Didn't they? And North Carolina, I mean, Rhode Island and North Carolina yeah. didn't ratify until after the new government formed. All right, so Tom, before we go, any closing words on the Constitutional Convention um, and kind of like wrapping up big ideas for to take away today? I mean, I would just sort of reinforce the big idea we started with at the beginning, which is that this new constitution, it's creating a new national government for America. And what the founders are trying to do is they're trying to create a new government more powerful than the Articles of Confederation, but also one of limited powers. And so across, and, and I mean, the last thing I'll emphasize is that it's, it's amazing to go back and read the debates at the convention because so, so many of the things that they're battling over about the structure of government connect with deep principles that we argue about for the rest of American history, everything from separation of powers, checks and balances, especially federalism, that balance of power between the national governments and the states, and also the role and the, the, the role uh, 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 that you know, the institution of slavery is going to play in shaping the economy and politics of America from then all the way until the outbreak of civil war in 1860. Yeah, Amy's question was like, did the founding fathers believe that slavery would eventually fade away? Um, like, the, and she kind of references Thomas Jefferson putting that in the in his original language in some of his writings, and then backing off of that. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's an interesting moment because you would say even among the the slaveholding delegates at the convention, most of them, especially those that aren't from deep South states like South Carolina and Georgia, there is a basic assumption that the institution of slavery is gonna sort of die out on its own. Connecticut's Oliver Ellsworth, there's a quote where he says, slavery in time will be but a speck in our country. And so th th there is sort of this sense that history is on the side of eventually getting rid of this institution of slavery. People didn't really like it. They sort of felt stuck with it. But the sense was that, you know, the institution of slavery isn't, it's not, it's not as economically dynamic as other 
other other forms of of, of of organizing labor, and that in the end it's going to die out with us having to act too greatly. Unfortunately, the prediction was you know totally wrong, um, uh, uh, but certainly for the founding generation, they had they they they, they thought and they hoped, uh, many of them did, uh, that the institution of slavery would die out. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tom. I think this was a great class. Uh, students, thank you for joining us. Um, don't forget to join us on Friday um, when we are talking uh, to Jill Lepore about the Constitutional Convention. She's our uh, special guest. And then next week we are, I think I think I have this right, next week is our slavery classes. Uh, so we will kind of dive into those issues a little bit uh, deeper next week. So thank you so much. All right, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jenna. Bye, everybody.